Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 208, Never Stop Writing, an interview with Liz Johnson coming to you on Thursday, August 13th, 2020. So if you had some vacation time doing something fun, I just finished, well, not just, just, but uh, last week I got to have a whole week of vacation, six whole days of not doing any work or checking my email. And then, you know, real life started back up again and I had to get back to it. But it was so nice to relax and read and... Yes, we spent a lot of time in front of the TV. Why? Because during John's three weeks vacation, he gets three weeks in the summer. I only took one because I had so much work to do. We decided to watch the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe in chronological order for the first time. 23 movies in 21 days. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but it was so much fun and it was really interesting because you can see different things in the story kind of pop out at you a little differently when you're watching it in chronological order instead of movie order. So sometimes you'll be watching a movie and you're like, oh, I remember this has to do with something that happened, you know, two years ago in the movie that came out two years ago. But now, or if you watch them in um, in date order, in release order on DVD or wherever you're watching them, um, even if you just watched it yesterday, you still have to remember it's something that happened six hours ago, you know, in the movie that you watched two movies ago or whatever. And then you're like, oh, but when you watch it in chronological order, kind of most things are really happening like boom, boom, boom. There was one thing where John's like, mm, I think it would have been better if we watched this movie in between, I can't remember what comes after Guardians of the Galaxy 2, but he's like, we should have watched it in between Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2 because of this one thing that happens. And and I was like, yeah, okay, next time we'll do it that way. But it was so much fun and seeing the entire story come together and I loved it. So hopefully you are doing something fun and safe. We are also spending a lot of time in our vacation home, which is our balcony. (laughs) So we've got our astroturf down for grass and we've got the table and chairs and the solar lights and the candles and the sun umbrella and the hammock, which has to only be um, put out when it's used and then folded back up again because otherwise it takes up most of the balcony. And reading and uh, plus, you know, still running, uh, getting ready for the half marathon, which even though it's canceled, I'm still going to run it on the same day. So that will be fun, except for it's been so, so hot. But my friend Rob David has been running with me every Sunday on the super long runs. We just did nine miles a few days ago, which normally would be totally fine. I mean, you know, generally, generally it would have been much better except for that it's so hot, though it was better than the day that we did the eight mile run two weeks ago because anyway, you don't want to hear me talk about running, but I will say find something in your life that you have a really good understanding of how this thing works in your life. And for me, running fits this bill. And then compare your writing life to it so that you can have something that you're comparing. So for instance, sometimes uh, when I'm running, particularly, you know, when it's eight, nine, 10 miles, I get near the end, I'm tired, I'm hot, I just want it to be over. Um, Sometimes if it's really cool weather, actually, I I feel, you know, pretty good still. Um, Yeah, I feel really lucky that I really like running. I didn't know I liked running until I was like 39 years old, (laughs) but um I imagine the times that I've been in a half marathon or some other race and there's all these crowds near the finish line. People are cheering and, you know, they're usually cheering for their friends or I have no idea if anybody comes to cheer for just people. But in any case, you're running by and people are cheering and it just does something to your energy and you're like, okay, I'm exhausted, but this is cool and I can keep going. It's just another, you know, quarter of a mile or whatever. And when I'm doing the long runs and I start getting tired, I'll be like, okay, and right around this corner, that's where the crowd will be and they'll be cheering and everybody will be just like making me feel filled with energy. And then I try to to kind of get through that last sometimes half a mile or more just thinking about like what it's like to have everybody like giving me energy and telling me I can do it. And so when I'm writing, sometimes I'm like, okay. 
I just need to get this one thing done. And then, you know, it'll be like the people are cheering and they'll be like, come on, you can do this scene. I know it's a hard scene, but it'll be great. And then you'll have finished it and everybody will be like, woohoo. So find something in your life that you can give yourself extra energy for when you kind of make it as a parallel to your writing. Um, it's possible that you think I'm nuts, but you're probably not listening to this podcast if you're not a writer. And if you're a writer, more people think things about you are nuts than what you think are nuts about me. Probably you and I are very similar. So that's why I'm giving you uh, this little tip because um, particularly when it's hot and it's summer and it's vacation, or maybe it's super cold and winter and you're staying inside if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, there are times when you're just like, I need some more motivation. <laughs> so find something in your own life that already motivates you. And if writing is that thing for you, if you really never have much problem at all getting your writing done and getting going and whatever, use that for this other thing in your life that you need some motivation for. Um, I have no idea what that could be for you. Uh, something else that you're learning to do or some kind of exercising like with me that you're also doing. Um, I think that it works out pretty well. It's been working for me actually for several years, many years. Um, anything that you can take the, the positive energy from one part of your life and transfer it to the other part. I think is a win. So that's my little bit of a tip, which is funny because I was actually going to tell you, um, little reminder, I've decided to do a Facebook Live weekly writing tip on the Facebook page for Right Now Workshop and Podcast. So that's the name of the page. You can just search it in Facebook, Right Now Workshop and Podcast. And um, I've been doing it uh, every Tuesday, except for last week because I was on vacation because I was like, no, I'm really, really going to be on vacation, <laughs> not doing work. Uh, so I do it at two o'clock my time, which is 8 a.m. Eastern, which I know is the crack of, oh my gosh, it's not even dawn. Pacific time. <laughs> but um, I had to pick a time that worked for me. And it's always going to be there. So even if you don't watch it live, you can just remember, oh, Tuesday, I got to go watch the writing tip. It's usually just a few minutes long. And it's just something to get you inspired and be like, yes, okay, writing today. <laughs> All right, that is it for me. Remember, we are on summer schedule, so it'll be another two weeks before you get the next interview. But today's interview is with Liz Johnson, who is just fun and also full of energy. So you just need to take all this positive energy and then apply it to the other area of your life where you need just a little bit more positive energy. Liz has got it, and she tells us her story, which is just super fun and interesting. Um, it will also make you kind of want to hate her a little bit because you're like, dang, you're the kind of person that I want to be. You started writing when you were a kid, and then you kind of immediately made a career out of it. Um, I, I love to hate you, Liz, but I can't hate you because you're totally adorable and nice. <laughs> So that's me and her talking about writing. Totally super fun. Hopefully you'll find some great tips and again, inspired and um, feeling encouraged and motivated and whatever it is that you need this week. That's what I hope you get out of the episode. Remember, um, make a little writing sprint for yourself. Just tell yourself, I just need to do 20 minutes, 30 minutes, set a timer, do nothing else, don't check anything, don't do anything but type, 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 20 minutes, boom, and all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch more words than you had before, probably several hundred. Maybe if you like were totally on a roll and you're a fast typist, it could be almost four pages, who knows? So enjoy it. Remember, this is what you love. Don't think of it too much as work or else it becomes work. That's something that I have to work with. Um, it can be a little hard, but you just got to get your mind in the right place. And that's what I try to do with these interviews and these all the episodes is try to help us both to keep our mind in like this good, cool place where we're getting lots of inspired, fun, fabulous writing done. Okay, here's Liz. Have a great week. Today's guest is Liz Johnson. Liz is the author of more than a dozen novels, including A Sparkle of Silver, A Glitter of Gold, The Red Door Inn, Where Two Hearts Meet, and On Love's Gentle Shore, as well as a New York Times bestselling novella and a handful of short stories. She makes her home in Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome, Liz. 
Hi, thanks so much for having me, Kitty. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, this is so exciting. You're just such a peppy person. I love having peppy people on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're a peppy person, which makes it so fun to talk with you. Oh, thanks. Well, now that we've founded our next Mutual Admiration Society, I think yes. we're set. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we were talking before the show trying to figure out whether or not you and I have lived in the same place at any time, but maybe maybe in the same state at the same time. But Yes, yeah. yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, I've lived in Arizona for a good majority of my life and uh, then moved around a lot, but I'm settled in Phoenix now and really love it. Nice. Now, has your spring been uh, relatively easy or have you hit any, you couldn't have hit a hundred degree day yet, but have you had any hot days? Uh, yeah, not yet. It's in the 80s right now, which is uh, pretty lovely. Um, we had a pretty uh, mild winter and uh, yeah, so I, I know the, the heat is coming this summer, uh, <laughs> but for now I'm really taking advantage of and enjoying uh, the beautiful weather this spring. Yeah, I have to say that's one of the things that, um, well, I'm going to ask you some questions about the research that you've done because yeah. you have written books that are set on total opposite ends of the country and yeah. you don't right now live anywhere near them. So I'm going to ask you about research. But one sure. of the things that, um, that always makes me kind of nervous when I'm researching something is that if I hadn't lived in Phoenix, I would not mm -hmm. have known the little the little weird things that, um, that I've got to put in a book somewhere, like yeah. just crossing your fingers that the first 100 degree day is way late in May because you're yes. like, I can't take it for longer than. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And there's, then, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. And then the other thing is the, um, having to use maybe, maybe the cars are made better now, but when we first moved there, we were pretty young and we had an old car and we had no idea that we were going to have to keep pot holders in the car because mm -hmm. the steering wheel and the shifter would get so hot. Yes. Yes. I have a, a very fancy um, steering wheel cover just so that I don't burn my hands. Uh, and I decided when I moved back to Arizona, it was a hundred percent worth it. Uh, I will say that um, one thing that always um, surprised and I always got questioned about when I lived in other parts of the country, especially Colorado Springs, uh, they always asked, asked about my dash mat because I have basically a carpet cover on my dashboard, which keeps the sun from cracking it. But um, everyone was like, what is this? Why do you have this in your car? And I was like, well, everybody in Arizona has them. Like, <laughs> otherwise the sun just eats your, eats up the vinyl of the dashboard. And, um, and so, yeah, so I, I definitely have, I've always had one of those. Uh, I think because um, I bought my car in Arizona before I moved and it just was like such a natural thing that, you know, in my family, when somebody buys a new car, their first birthday or Christmas gift is a dash mat. Like that's how, <laughs> that's how our family functions. And it's just part of living in Arizona. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's great. See, that's the sort of thing that needs to go into a book sometime. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So you've done lots of things. Um, we talked beforehand and I was like, wow, that's interesting. And that's interesting. But tell us about like Liz, the writer. How did you get started? Were you writing since you were three or how did you start? Yeah, um, almost since I was three. Uh, I wrote my first story when I was seven. Uh, it was, I was homeschooled at the time, and I remember my mom assigning me, it was a story starter, and it was two paragraphs about a bear that was like going to hibernation or something, and um, I was supposed to write two more paragraphs. Well, I wrote two pages, <laughs> and I couldn't stop writing, and um, you know, it was after school hours. You know, we're homeschooled, so our hours were a little uh, different, but um, it, like it was like late into the evening and I kept asking my parents, how do you spell this word? How do you spell that word? <clears throat> and so anyway, so I just, I loved to write. And um, so that I, I wrote that first story when I was seven and I signed my first book contract when I was 27. Wow. And I just, all, all during that time, I was writing every chance I could get. Every school assignment that was something creative was absolutely going to be a story. Every, um, you know, just every chance I got. I distinctly remember uh, uh, being a senior in high school and my best friend was uh, sewing her prom dress for 4-H. Like it was like both 4-H and her prom dress. And 
I went over to her house and I had a floppy disk and um, with my story on it. And I, I would go over to her house and sit and type on her computer in her room and she would sew and we would chat a little bit, but it was just like, I was writing all the time. Yeah. And <clears throat> when I, but I always laugh that I got through college without taking a single English class because I tested out of like the basic English classes that, that you have to take. And then I, um, I was a public relations major. And so I took a ton of journalism and like writing for public relations classes, but I never took uh, English classes. And so my friends all were like, oh, you're not really that serious about writing, even though on the side, I was literally writing a novel while I was in college, you know? And so oh. anyways, um, I graduated from college and I knew that I wanted to work in, Christ in Christian publishing. I knew that I wanted to uh, write, but I didn't, I still at that point didn't think about writing as a career or as sort of a, um, as really, I, I wasn't even thinking about being published so much as like, it was like a far off dream. And I didn't really have like a plan for this is how I'm going to make it happen. Right. And then my mom, um, my mom's brother, actually, my uncle called me and was like, Hey, I heard about this program, Jerry Jenkins, who wrote the left behind series. He bought the Christian writers guild and he has this, um, this, uh, uh program. It's a two year correspondence course. And so my mom and I talked about it and looked at it and, um, uh, they, the course pairs you with a mentor in the industry. And for two years, you're working on projects to help you become a professional writer and to learn the business and to learn how to craft a proposal and put all the pieces together. Anyways, um, I, I was a broke, like, you know, 23 year old at the time. And I was like, I have no money. I have no, um, like I barely have a job. <laughs> and, like I was living in a, you know, a tiny apartment. Uh, and, but my mom and dad said, if this is something you're really interested in, we'll, we'll fund the tuition for this program if you want to do wow. it. So um, as soon as I, basically, as soon as I graduated college and then I did, um, I dove right into that and, and did the two year correspondence course. And it was amazingly helpful. And I still at that point was like, I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'll ever be able to make it. Like maybe I don't have what it takes, but now I look back and I was like, well, I was like 23, 24 years old. Like I, I had a little bit of life learning to do yet. And so I ended up moving uh, for a job in publishing and ended up in Colorado Springs with a friend who, uh, I worked with and we spent a lot of time in the mail room, like mailing books and packages out to, uh, reviewers and, um, and so we would, we would just chat during that time. And she, anyways, I told her about this story idea I had and she, and I was like, but I'll never finish it. And she said, yes, you will. And I was like, <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> she's like, you're going to finish that book. And so, um, every day she would ask me, did you write last night? And I got so tired of saying no, like I didn't want to let her down. And so I put together a schedule and said, okay, I'm going to write three days a week. I'm going to write two weeknights and on Saturdays, and I'm going to put in at least an hour every time. And that's just my goal. That's my baseline goal. And then of course, um, so then once the story got going, then I couldn't stop. Then I was writing way more than that, but at least like it, it got me started so that I could say like, yes, I wrote last night. Yes, I'm on schedule. Yes, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be. And, uh, and that became my first book. And, um, and so, yeah, so I wrote that in 2007, 2008. Um, I sent it off to a publisher in 2008 and, um, uh, I, I knew that I, um, I had written it for Love Inspired Suspense, a line of, um, Harlequin. And I thought, oh, um, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know they don't require an agent. And so I mailed it off to them. And I've um, got a very nice rejection letter. And I was like, well, that's the end of that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> of course, um, I, I mailed it to them in, well, my proposal, like three chapters and such. I mailed it to them in uh, October. And I got the rejection letter in uh, right before Christmas, like right before I was going to fly home for Christmas break. And I was just devastated. And I was like, oh. Yeah. So I came back from that and um, came back to Colorado Springs and sort of took an assessment. Okay, where am I at? And I said, okay, I reread the letter, which was um, very positive, but just said, your book doesn't meet our guidelines. And I said, 
I could change my book. And <laughs> so I sent them a thank you note that just said, thank you so much for looking at this. I really appreciate it. Could I make some changes and resubmit? And um, I got back from the editor there a two page revision letter that was like, change all these things. And I, and then re, and then submit the whole manuscript. And I was like, That's okay. awesome. So I set to work doing that. And I sent in the whole manuscript and I got another letter that said, it's still not there, but here's some more things for you to work on. Okay. <laughs> so I went back to work and I rewrote it. And, um, we went back and forth four times and, uh, by July, I was pretty sure it was never going to happen. And I was like, nope, nope, this is just not, not the thing. This is not the life for me. I don't think I can do this. And, um, and then I was actually at a work uh, event. It was a really big convention in Orlando. And I was like in the bowels of the convention center. I got no cell phone reception. I was like down, down um, in the basements. And I got out of the basement and I saw that I had a voicemail on my phone. And I was like, what is this 212 area code? What is this? Who is, but I was, I was a publicist at the time and thought, oh, no problem. This is somebody calling about something. And so I stepped to the side to listen to the voicemail. And it was a call from Harlequin saying, you know, call us back. They didn't tell, tell me that they were making me an offer. It was just call us back. And I was like, oh no. So I had to wait till the end of the day. And I thought there's no way that they're still going to be in the office that I'm going to yeah. catch them. But sure enough, I called them back that evening and they were still there and they were like, we want to offer you a contract. And I just about, you know, it, it was, it was the most amazing moment. You know, it was just such an incredible moment. And so, wow. um, so yes, I've been writing my whole life. But I certainly had a lot of doubts along the way that I was ever going to get there. But every everything that I wrote was practice. Every, you know, every um, book that I wrote that was really terrible, and there are some really bad ones out there. All of it was just really great practice to get me to where I needed to be. Wow, what a fantastic story! <laughs> Thank you. We all love the call stories, though, don't we? Yes, <laughs> yes. Oh. There's something just so special about that, and. There's a reason yeah. why writers um, remember their first call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I would say that the first time I talked to an editor on the phone, I remember almost as clearly as my husband proposing to me. <laughs> <laughs> kind of up there with like amazing yes. life-changing moments. <laughs> it really is though. I mean, it changes your whole life. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so that's been a while and now you've got more than a dozen books and yeah. um, series from a couple of different places. So I'm not sure really where we want to start, but let's just say your newest book is called A Dazzle of Diamonds mm -hmm. and it closes the trilogy of the name of the series that I can't remember something in Georgia. Uh -huh. It's the Georgia Coast Romance series. There you go. Yep. Okay, yeah. so tell us a little bit about that. So um, I know a lot of traditional publishing contracts, um, particularly anything that's like romance, romantic suspense, romantic something, something subgenre, a yeah. lot of them do seem to be trilogies. And, and I know that you've got at least two. So tell us about your experience with getting involved in traditional publishing, writing a trilogy, finishing a trilogy. Yeah. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions there. Um, I know. I kind of uh, wanted yeah. to just no, throw that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go wherever you uh, like with that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll talk about the Georgia Coast Romance um, series first um, because that that series was, it, it's very different than anything I've written before. And I absolutely oh. loved writing it. It's a split time series. So each book contains um, a historical diary or letters or something that reveal um, the past. And the past is tied to what the, the treasure that the modern characters are looking for. So all three books are about a lost treasure and our characters are trying to find it for different reasons. Um, but I was inspired to write that series uh, when I traveled to St. Simon's Island, Georgia. Oh. I was living in Nashville and my aunt called me and was like, hey, um, we're, we're going to vacation on St. Simon's. We have a condo. Do you want to come visit us for a couple days? And I was like, oh, that sounds so great. And she's like, I thought you could just drive down here. And I was like, it's like a nine hour drive. I don't really <laughs> want to do that on my own. And she was like, um, we'll bring a friend. And I was like, okay. So my best friend and I got a car and tooled down to St. Simon's Island. And um, one of the days that we were down there, uh, we also went to Savannah. 
just for a day trip. And I had never been to Savannah and it was incredible. The history was so vivid. And I just remember like walking through, there's a, a cemetery kind of right in the middle of town where um, uh, during the civil war, Sherman's army kind of, you know, they were burning everything to the coast uh, across Georgia uh, in his march to the sea. And um, he got to Savannah and basically was like, the city is so beautiful, I can't burn it down. I'm going to give it to President Lincoln as a Christmas present because it was <laughs> right before Christmas. And so I, um, so, but when you walk through that cemetery, like all the, um, all the walls are lined with um, cracked and broken gravestones because the Union Army came in and there were like 60,000 people in the army and like 30,000 people actually lived in Savannah at the time. So there, there were so many people they didn't have a place to stay. So they're staying in the cemeteries and they just, they were not careful or thoughtful about um, the cemeteries. And so um, gravestones were broken and um, markers were lost and Wow. Um, but I just was like, this is incredible history. And what would it have been like to be on, um, to, to be a Savannah resident when that happened? And what would it have been like to be a union officer when that happened? And so all of these little things are like, and, um, and then we had lunch at the pirate's house, which is this fantastically over the top, um, uh, pirate restaurant, pirate themed restaurant that, uh, where they tell stories about how maybe Robert Louis Stevenson wrote uh, Treasure Island there. And, you know, there's lots of things like maybe historically that didn't happen. But if you ask somebody who lives in Savannah, that happened. And <laughs> it's like, it's part of the city lore. And I just loved how the people there loved to tell stories. And so, um, so I just fell in love with this little section of the Georgia coast. And I was like, I want to write books there. And so I did. And, um, and I, yeah, so the first book is set on St. Simon's Island and it's about kind of a grand estate that I actually modeled after Hearst Castle on the California coast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. My dad and I had visited there a number of years ago and it was so fascinating. And so um modeled that after Hearst Castle and then um, and a lost treasure that's there and um, in, in the book, not at Hearst Castle. I'm not aware <laughs> yeah. of a lost treasure at Hearst Castle, although that would be cool. <laughs> that um, would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the second book is A Glitter of Gold, which I call my pirate book. It's about, um, it's set in Savannah about um, a lost, um, yeah, a lost, um, a sunken pirate ship. Well, it's actually a merchant ship ship that was sunk by pirates. And then um, uh, and then A Dazzle of Diamonds is kind of my uh, Savannah and Civil War story. And so it's about um, some Civil War smuggling um, because, of course, the Union Army had blockaded the, the coast there. And so there's some things that are smuggled in. And um, my modern day hero, his um, his family is accused of being smugglers and traitors to the Confederacy during the Civil War, which, you know, here we are 150 years later, but that really matters to um, a lot of people, especially for my hero who is running for public office. And so, yeah, um, yeah so just, uh, it was such a fun story to write and I just loved that whole series. And um, it's, each book is really kind of a standalone. You don't have to read the others, but every now and then you'll see characters pop up that you'll recognize from other books, which I always love just um, adding them in there so that people kind of, if you've read the previous books, you have that moment of like, oh, oh, I loved him or, you know, or whatever. So. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, either in chapter one or chapter two where um, the, the main people, uh, Tucker and Penelope or PJ as he calls uh -huh. her, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And they're uh, talking to a fellow who I can't exact, I, I wasn't exactly sure where I was, but he knows history. And he said something about a sunken ship. I'm like, I yeah. bet that's something. I mean, nobody randomly talks about sunken ships. I'm like, that yeah. must be from one of the other two books. <laughs> yeah, that, it's from right, the second totally book. Fun. Yep. Nice. Yeah, for sure. So did you, so, Okay, everybody who's listening is probably a writer of some level from beginning to intermediate to I have no idea. Um, so research is always something that I'm asking people, uh, what have you done? Because in general, I, I tend to say to myself, oh, I don't like research. That's why I write contemporary. <laughs> 
But then the thing is, is that there are so many fascinating things in the world yeah. to read about and learn about that it turns out that I probably do like research. I just mm-hmm. don't call it research when it's about something that I'm interested in. Yes. <laughs> so how did it, so you, you were living in Nashville, you went on this vacation to Georgia and then you mm-hmm. came back. And so how did you start writing three books set in Savannah? Did you take more trips? Did you ask people who live there? Um, I wrote the first book based on that original trip. Um, my aunt and uncle uh, took uh, took us on a um, uh, like a like a bus tour of Savannah, and right. then also like on Saint Simon's Island, there was this. I want to use the word bus, but it really wasn't. It was like a rickety old. It felt like you were kind of in like a nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties kind of. A rambling van or something. Anyways, they <laughs> um, they took us on that, um, at, which was a historical tour of St. Simon's Island, and we looked at um, old churches and um, just gorgeous, gorgeous um, uh, trees and uh, just lines of tree, you know, like whole rows of trees. And um, as somebody from Arizona who doesn't get to see um, trees very often, <laughs> not beautiful yeah. ones anyways. Um, <laughs> it just was, it was so stunning and it just really hit home with me. So, um, yeah, so, so that was sort of the inspiration. And then of course I had to dive in a little bit deeper and do more research about what was going on in the 1920s. Um, and, uh, which is the historical side of that story. Um, and as far as contemporary side of things, I, I love to read as well. Like, you know, just to, to find out things like, um, well, for that particular book, I spent a lot of time reading about dementia because um, the heroine's grandmother suffers from dementia. And um, she, um, and, and what are the differences between dementia and Alzheimer's? And I really wasn't educated and didn't understand some of the nuances and and still don't. I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but um, certainly had to read up on that so that I felt like I could um, speak into the grandma situation and represent her well and talk to friends who um, have have lost grandparents um, to Alzheimer's and, and things of that nature. So I spent a lot of time reading and a lot of time talking to friends to get their experiences. What I love about writing and about stories in general is that everybody has their own experience with something. And so um, I want to represent them what that experience well, but I love that there's freedom to say your experience might not be exactly like my experience or, um, you know, but, but we, but there's still some hope and some joy and something to be learned from that or something to be um, encouraged from by that. So um, yeah, so that sort of got me going on, on the first book. And then when I was working on the second book, which I actually had gotten the idea from my first trip to Savannah, uh, we were sitting at the pirate's house and we were in the bar section at, you know, kind of a high, high top table. And um, I was listening to the bartender who was talking to a couple people who were seated at the bar. And she's telling this story about how uh, a few years ago they had been renovating and they found these, um, they found in the dungeon, well, <laughs> they found a dungeon basically below the pirate's house and it had um, like chains on the walls and people were like, why would, why would who are they holding down there? And she told the story of how uh, young men might get slightly inebriated at a, a pub and they would, um, they would club them over the head, drag them downstairs, hold them until a ship came into port. And then when the ship came into port, they would shuttle them through these secret tunnels underground and um, basically conscript them to work on these ships. And oftentimes they were merchant ships or um, uh, Savannah and Georgia was founded after sort of the golden age of piracy, but there were still plenty of pirate activities going on at that time. And I would say if you're conscripting men to work on your ship, you're you're a pirate. Like you're definitely not abiding by the rules here. Yeah. And so anyway, so I loved that idea and that story of um, how of, of young men being conscripted. And I just had this idea of what if a young woman, um, what if her brother was taken? 
how, what lengths would she go to to get him back to find him? And so that's the story in the historical diary in A Glitter of Gold, and um, which then is about the sunken ship that they're searching for in modern times. So anyway, I, wow. I was inspired by that because I like to listen to people's stories. And I'm yeah. like, that's so fun. And so that became the story for book two. But while I was working on that book, um, I said, I need, I need more history. I, I need more experience. My heroine was a, um, uh, uh, pirate tour guide. So she <laughs> takes people on walking tours of Savannah and talks about the pirate history of Savannah. And, um, I said, that's really cool. I, um, I need to go on a tour. Like I need to actually experience this. So my mom and I went back to Savannah. My mom's my travel buddy. And <laughs> she and I went back to Savannah. Uh, it was her first trip, but we spent a week there and we went on a bunch of tours and we um, walked, just walked the streets and walked the squares and just helped me get a general sense and a general feel for, um, for that location and for that area. And yeah. Um, I love Savannah. It's just such a, such an inspiring and historic city. And they're so, um, you know, because it wasn't burned during the civil war, it really is one of the oldest, um, areas in the South where you can still, like, you can see these buildings that might date back to, you know, well before the 1700s or I'm sorry, well into the 1700s. And, um, yeah, while we were there, we also drove up to Charleston, which is just a, uh, about an hour north, and um, that's even more historic. I mean, that's like, you know, into the 1600s, and just amazing old buildings, and um, architecture, and history, and just a very, very interesting place. And Charleston has lots of pirate history as well, which I was just fascinated by. It was so fun. Oh my so, gosh. yeah, so I love to, to look at that kind of stuff, and, and dig into that kind of stuff, and I like to experience it myself so that I can then write about it. But at the end of the day, I find that, um, like I want to get the details right and the details are important, yeah. but I don't stress about researching um, every single little, de you know, minute detail of, of um, you know, what tree is in the corner of this particular square in Savannah. Um, my concern is with a sense of place, a sense of, can you feel, can the reader put themselves there? Can they imagine themselves there? Can they um, smell what, you know, what the wind is carrying? Can they smell the, you know, the azaleas and the, um, the flowers that are really blooming at this time of year, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So I really focus on that, but I, I always recommend and always love research trips. Um, and a lot of times it's just for inspiration, like the details, you know, you can look them up on all sorts of great tools that we have now, like Google Earth and uh, YouTube has just, you know, tons of videos. If you just type in the place that you're looking for, uh, yeah. you can see what a walking tour in Savannah might look like. But for me, actually taking a walking tour makes writing about it so much more interesting and helps me find some of the, you know, some of the interesting details. Um, we went on a walking tour in Savannah, uh, my mom and I, where we paid for it just to be us. And I told oh, nice. the I told the tour guide, I said, I'm writing about a tour guide. Um, can I ask you some questions? And she was so gracious. Like she let us ask just all sorts of questions about what that's, um, you know, what it's like to be a tour guide in Savannah and, and how do you juggle it and what other jobs do you have to have? And, you know, that kind of thing. And um, she, she just was so interesting and uh, was just a really kind woman to share her, de her history and details with us. So. Yeah. Wow. And does she know that you wrote the book? Like, have you been able to stay in touch? Or yes. Tell her? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was writing the book when I, um, when we were there and afterwards, yeah, I let her know that I finished it and that it had come out and yeah. So it was great. That's so cool. I mean, can yeah. you imagine it's you and I, we've been writers, uh, storytellers of one kind or another, you know, our whole lives. So I literally, do find it difficult to imagine someone who doesn't have stories in their head. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but 
with that said, I do try to imagine what it's like to be like, oh my gosh, someone like asked me questions and then wrote a story and that, that character is kind of a little bit me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'm not sure if she wants uh, that character to be entirely her because that particular character spent six years in prison uh, oh. before the story starts. <laughs> <laughs> so Georgia and her pirate tours are her second chance, are her, <laughs> her restart on life. And um uh, but she ended up being one of the most fun and um, characters that I've written. Not as in that she's funny. I just really loved exploring what her life was like to think about. I, I know nothing about being in prison beyond that. Right. Um, at one point, I had a friend who was in prison, and he and I corresponded for um, several years. Um, and But beyond that, it just it was really interesting to imagine what kind of shame, you know, the mistakes that lead you to prison. Right like bring, like that you carry with you. And so um, I loved exploring that part of her. Wow. And yeah. all of this is in A Glitter of Gold? A Glitter of Gold, yes. All right. I, I have to say, I do have a soft spot for anything that's a, a pirate book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I loved it. And I loved, um, man, I loved researching it too, because I didn't know anything about finding sunken ships. So I yeah. listened to um, and read several books about, um, you know, people who search for underwater treasure. And it was just so interesting. And um, the laws that have changed that um, affect that. And um, yeah, it just, yeah, it's so interesting. So fascinating to me. Wow. Yeah. All right. So, so that's one coast of the U.S., but then yeah. you have at least one series, and I think you're starting a new series set entirely on the other coast of the U.S. Actually, it's on the same coast. It's just way far north. Mm -hmm. Oh, Prince, yeah. Okay, so Prince, Prince, Prince Edward, Edward Island. Island. Yep, it's northeast of Maine. Which one is the one that's near Vancouver? That's where I thought it was. Um, that's Prince somebody else's island, I think. Prince oh. Albert, maybe. I don't you know. know what? When we're done, I'm going to have to go look it up because yes. all this time I thought Prince Edward Island was the one that was near Vancouver. Okay. And a lot of people think that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's not just me. <laughs> no, it's not you at all. <laughs> yeah. All right. So tell us, how did you end up writing books in that area? Sure. Well, Prince Edward Island, of course, is famously home to Anne of Green Gables. And um, Lucy Maud Montgomery, who wrote those books, uh, is from the island. And so I had told my mom many years ago. So my mom got me hooked on Anne when I was a kid. We watched all the um, miniseries and loved them and rewatched them many times, but I had never read the books. And uh, when I was 19, I um, worked at Walt Disney World for a semester. It was a college wow. internship. And so uh, I was, I, I took just the bare minimum for, you know, to, to last a semester. I was living in like, you know, um, uh, furnished housing and everything. And so I, I got there and um, I was so lonely. And it wasn't that I didn't, like I had roommates and I had people to talk to, but I discovered like I was eating lunch alone every day. And I was like, Aww. I just need a friend. And so I called my mom and I said, I, I just need some books. And she said, what do you want? And I said, I don't care, just anything, <laughs> just something. And so she sent me her cherished Anne of Green Gables series. And it had been like on the, the, her nightstand for like my entire childhood. Like it just was like always there. And so she sent me this series and I read the whole series while I was there um, over the course of the semester and just fell even more in love. And wow. so I told my mom, I said, when I sign my first book contract, I'm going to take you to Prince Edward Island. And she oh. laughed at me. <laughs> yes, um, and course. she claims she did not laugh, but she did. She totally, <laughs> totally laughed at me. And she, um, and I don't know if it's because she thought that I would never sign a book contract <laughs> or if she thought it was because I would never spend my money on her to do that. Um, and so I got my first book contract and nobody tells you that you don't make any money on your first book generally. Uh, so I said, mom, we're going to have to wait for my second book. And so in 2010, I got a contract for my second book and she, I called her and I said, mom, get your passport. We're going to go to PEI. And she was like, really? And I said, yes. So in September of 2010, we went to PEI for the first time and it was, it, it was everything I hoped it would be. And so much more. It was, wow. I, I did not know how peaceful 
it could be. Um, you know, living in living and growing up in the U.S., everything is hurry, 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 and rush, 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 and um, big cities and lots of traffic. And all of a sudden, we were on Prince Edward Island, and we were hiking one day over. Um, they had this gorgeous floating boardwalk that. Um, um, goes over these marshlands that goes up to these migrating sand dunes and you get to the top of the sand dune and you look over and it's white beach just as far as the eye can see and and then ocean beyond and there was no one there except me and my mom what? and I was like what <laughs> now that's the only time that's ever happened every other time that I've been back there's been people there but even then it's a few people here or there it's like you can really feel like you're alone yeah. uh, at one point we were driving and my mom yells stop and I was like what what's going on and she's like look at that house and there was this gorgeous it was like a castle sitting right on one of the cliffs right over the ocean and and, and she's like, I want to take a picture. And I look around. There's no other cars around. So I just stop in the middle of the road. <laughs> and, and we stop. And she gets out and takes pictures. And then we go on. And we saw no one the whole time. And it just it's just such the most peaceful place. And uh, they call it the gentle island for a reason. Like, there's just a little slower pace. There's a little. And everyone is so kind. And it certainly thrives on tourism. There are people to be found if that's what you want, but there are places to get away and there are places to um, just escape what, um, if, if you need an escape, I totally recommend it. So wow. anyways, so that was our first trip in uh, 2010. Our last day on the island was basically shut down because there was a hurricane that came through and just about everybody lost power. Mm -hmm. And um, and still it was uh, just a wonderful trip. And, um, so then we decided we were going to go back the next year and we took my sister and then a couple years later, well, maybe we should go back again. And so, <laughs> so we've been, we've been four times now and yeah. um, we were planning to go this summer, but that's being canceled. <laughs> so yeah. um, maybe next year we'll get to go back because uh, it's been five years since we've been there and I, um, I, I miss it a lot. <laughs> it's funny how you miss a place that you've literally spent, you know, no more than five weeks of your entire life there. And yet it's, it's so much a part of me. So anyway, so when I, um, uh, the first time I went, I had no intention of writing a book set there. And then when I went back, I like instantly had an idea and wow. was like, there's this gorgeous little, little tiny fishing village, um, that has somebody told us about their boardwalk. It's like, um, it's like not even two kilometer boardwalk. And, um, but it's just really lovely. And I, I was like, oh, this is such a cute little quaint town, but it doesn't have a bed and breakfast. It has no inn. We can't stay here. And I was like, I could fix that. <laughs> so I wrote a book called The Red Door Inn, uh, which is the first book in the Prince Edward Island Dream Series about opening um, an inn right there in North Rustico. And, um, and that really became a series about um, broken people coming to an inn and finding, um, finding healing there. And that was sort of the theme in, of all the books in the series. Um, and, and there's only three. Oh, there's three and a novella, um, a Christmas novella. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I just, I was surprised how much I fell in love with it, but I'm always inspired when I travel and when I see new places to, um, and when those story ideas hit, then, then I just, you know, I love them. Um, I will say that that book did not, um, it took a long time to sell. I had already oh. written probably, let's see, that was in 20, so I probably wrote that in 2013. And, um, and so I had three or four books out at that time already. Um, but um, I wrote that book in uh, the Red Door Inn in six weeks because an editor that I was pitching to was about to go on maternity leave and I right. didn't want to miss her. So yeah. she had requested the full manuscript and I only had three chapters. And I was like, sure, no problem. And so I wrote the whole book in six weeks and it's, a, it's kind of a miracle that it's, um, like it didn't actually change that much from what I wrote to what was published. We, you know, we, we fixed several things and, but it's not like it took an entire overhaul or anything. It was a pretty, pretty easy edit. Um, and, and then, yeah, and uh, so 
and, and it was rejected by everybody, including the publisher who eventually published it oh. uh, because they were like, nobody's buying contemporary romance right now. Nobody likes it. You know, oh, it's not the market, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. So I set it aside and I kept writing and I kept writing for Love Inspired Suspense and I kept writing. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I was like, man, I love that book. I need something to happen for that book. And, um, and then about a year later, the editor who had rejected it called my agent and said, would, um, is that book still available? Can, you know, <laughs> can we look at that again? <laughs> and she, um, anyways, and then they bought it and, uh, they bought it in 2014 and then it took two years for it to come out and it came out in 2016. And, uh, and that was my first book with Ravel, who I've written now six books for and, uh, uh, the next three are under contract, and that's another Prince Edward Island series that um, I'm just getting started on. Wow. So more trips definitely are coming to Prince Edward I Island. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. Uh, yeah. Wow. All right. So what do you think are some top, do you have some top do's and don'ts for for researching, research trips in particular, maybe? I mean, it's yeah. it's definitely an expense for people. So how do you make sure that maybe you are, uh, of course, you're going to have a good time, uh -huh. but will, will any of this make it into the book to the point where I feel like that was worth it? Or what are the thoughts that, yeah. that you feel like are good ones to share with other writers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely there is an expense to it. So I, I think that if you are um, spending more than you can afford, that adds an extra stress to it. So I always recommend do what you can afford. Um, do what you feel comfortable with so that you're not adding all this extra stress to a trip that really you want to enjoy. Um, yeah. Because if you don't enjoy the trip, there's a good chance your characters aren't going to enjoy being there. Like that seeps in. Yeah. And so like the reason my characters love PEI so much is because I love PEI so much. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the same with Georgia. And so, um, yeah, so I say, you know, first of all, be, you know, just be thoughtful, be aware of what you feel comfortable doing and don't push yourself way beyond that. If you can't make it to the location where you want to set your book, that's okay. Um, but if you can, I do highly recommend it. It's fantastic. Um, I also recommend um, bringing a travel buddy, but maybe not bringing family. You know, it's kind of up to you and some families are different, but I find that um, if there are kids around, um, I love my nieces and nephews, but I have a hard time concentrating on the things that I need to concentrate on when I'm uh, doing a research trip when they're with me. Yeah. And so, um, so you know, figure out sort of what's, the, what's ideal for you to be able to pay attention to your surroundings. Um, I love to go traveling with my mom because she will take pictures. She takes tons of pictures, which is great. I highly recommend lots and lots of pictures. Uh, they will uh, jog your memory and remind you when you're back home. Oh, that's right. We went to the top of this lighthouse and it was so interesting. And you remember that view and how the ocean, you know, and, um, and all of those are little details that will be jogged by having good pictures. So I highly recommend good pictures. Um, also just taking time to stop and smell the roses, quite literally, like, Think about your senses and what are you experiencing in this mo moment? Not just what you can see, but what can you smell? What can you, um, what can you hear? What does it sound like? Savannah sounds to me like rumbling tour buses because every time you turn the corner, there's a giant white or orange tour bus just lumbering down the road. And because it's a tourist city, like it's a town for tourists and um, that's wonderful, but PEI does not sound like that. And so just taking a moment to sort of stop and say, okay, what do the waves on PEI sound very different than they do on the Pacific coast? Like on the Pacific coast, they crash against that California shore, but on PEI, they kind of laugh they're very gentle. They just laugh at the, at the, um, at the red sand beaches. And so, um, you, so just sort of being aware of those things. And then it's those little details that make it into your story that make the sense of place come alive. So definitely stop and smell the roses. Yeah. Wow. That's brilliant. You know, and you're, um, when you compared the two different kinds of sounds from the same ocean, <laughs> yes. hitting the same shore, yeah. um, uh, I, I was just thinking about all the places that I've lived when I've lived near an ocean and the times when I've taken just like a 30 second video so that mm -hmm. I can get the sound of it. 
I'm like, okay, this is so weird yes. because this is the same ocean hitting a different shore and it yes. sounds totally different. Totally different. Than- yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I generally tend to forget this, but I should be better at this when I go on research, research trips, which is just to jot down notes. Like you, you're not writing your story at that moment, but just to jot down a few notes to jog your memory. So between pictures and, um, you know, some written notes, I find that then when I sit down to write, it's easier to bring all of that sense of place back up. Um, sort of the well just kind of bubbles over a little bit. So Yeah. When you were talking, I was thinking about um, some places that I've been and <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm sure I've been this way for as long, certainly as long as I can remember. That would be longer than anybody else can remember. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, food is just like a major part of my yes. life and my yes. vacation. And and when you were talking, I don't know. It was something that you said uh, when you're talking about azaleas. Actually, I was thinking, okay, here in Malmo, Sweden, the smell that I would associate with Malmo is actually cinnamon. Oh because- wow. Um, cinnamon buns are a huge thing here. And Uh I, I swear it just like, if I walk past the bakery, I feel like I'm smelling cinnamon. But when I went to Paris, which honestly, I had no idea. Paris definitely has got the best bakeries that I've personally ever been to though. Someone just challenged me that I need to go to Montreal and I'm like, Oh, those would be French bakeries too. Wouldn't they? (laughs) Paris, the the smell. Okay. Actually, Paris reminds me of the smell of dirty streets, but also when I pass bakeries, butter. That's what I smell. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah. wait, bakeries in both spots, but they have two uh-huh. different smells. So I'm like, okay, if I ever write anything with somebody going there, I need to remember the smell. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. And I, um, it's interesting that you would talk about food because that's, I mean, that's a huge part of it as well. Like visiting a place and um, Prince Edward Island is, you know, it's a huge lobster fishing industry there. Oh. And so lobster is a big deal. Like they have something called lobster dinners where um, it's basically just a communal dinner and you sit around this large family table and you pass the plate, you pass the bowls and the dishes and everybody gets a lobster and I was terrified to go to one because I'd never had lobster before. And so instead I went to this restaurant that everybody raved and said had the best lobster. And so um, my mom and my sister and my niece were with me and we, um, I tried lobster for the first time and I hated it. Like I, like I, it was, I, I'm not really a seafood person anyways, yeah. but I was like, I'm going to try it. And I, I could barely get a few bites down. And I think it had something to do with the fact that we had been lobster fishing earlier in the day. Um, and uh, I had held a live lobster. And so I couldn't look that live lobster in the eye and then eat his cousin <laughs> for dinner. Yeah. Like I was like, no, I can't, I can't do that. And so um so, but having that experience personally, uh, when I wrote my, the next book in the series, the second book, it's about the chef at the, um, at the inn, the Red Door Inn. And um, she doesn't like lobster either, but her church is hosting a big lobster cook-off. So she's having to cook all this lobster and, um, you know, attempt to, you know, create a wonderful recipe with her lobster. And, um, and, and yet she doesn't like it. So she can't taste test it. <laughs> she, has to, she has the hero come in and give her a hand with that. But um, yeah, so food definitely is a big part of, um, it's a big part of locations and, um, and cities and how we, what we associate with that general area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So definitely everybody's listening. We should remember, um, don't be embarrassed. Food is an important part of distinguishing one setting from another. Yeah. Yes, for sure. For sure. Awesome. Liz, this has been great fun. Oh my gosh. (laughs) You're just so much fun to talk to. Thank you. Thank you. You too. This has been just a delight. Well, I don't want to interrupt you if you had any other thoughts that were like, um, you know, pieces of advice or wisdom from, from all the things that you've learned or places that you've been to for research or. I always feel like, like, I never want to give a prescriptive, this is how to do it kind of thing. My experience has been over the years that my style of writing and research has, has changed over the years. Huh. And, um, and I think, I think ultimately each author figures out what works for them. Um, but I love to, I love to talk about research trips because I have just loved going on mine. And I always say, if you get a chance to do it. Nice. 
Yeah. Awesome. Well, you, all the things that you've talked about, I'm sure people are like, wait, I got I to gotta check out this book or that book. So where can listeners find you and your books? Yeah, um, I am online at lizjohnsonbooks.com. Okay. Uh, that's my website. That's my Facebook. That's my Twitter. That's my Instagram. So um, I am in all those places. If you look for me on Instagram, you're going to see I don't post very often. Um, <laughs> but if um, uh, I'm on Facebook quite a bit, and um, I love to interact with people and I'm happy to answer questions. Wonderful. So people, they can just Google Liz Johnson books and find whatever their favorite way of communicating is. Exactly. Exactly. And um, I do have a, I have a newsletter as well that you can sign up for at LizJohnsonBooks.com and um, always talk, um, sharing about giveaways and things like that there. Oh, that's always fun because yeah. readers and writers, we're, we're all loving that. <laughs> we love a good giveaway. <laughs> that's right. Liz, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been great fun. Yeah, thank you.